Good afternoon um, and welcome to our virtual open house week with Shaw Academic Advising. My name is Amandeep Singh. I am the student engagement coordinator and an academic advisor within Shaw Advising. Um, we are super excited today to be able to have you all connect with some of our faculty and graduate students from the sociology department. Um, before we begin, I will be to, uh, today's moderator for the panel. Um, I would like to go over a few Zoom guidelines before we begin. Um, the first thing being, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, I ask that you use your um, Zoom feature below. Um, in the chat function, you should be able to um, message me your questions. Um, after you message me your question, I will ask that, that question aloud to our panelists today. Um, if by any chance you do drop off because of Wi-Fi connection issues, please feel free to log back into Zoom and I will connect you back to the meeting. Um, with that being said, we'll go ahead and start off with introductions from our panelists. So I'm going to first hand it off to Professor Dodson. Thanks, Amandeep. Um, welcome, everybody, for joining the panel. Um, my name is Kyle Dodson. I am a professor in sociology. Um, I don't know if you just want us to introduce ourselves, if you want us to like talk about our research interests or wait for we'll that. We'll get to that. So just brief introduction, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then... Waleed, would you like to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Waleed. Um, I'm a third year doctoral student in sociology. And Jared. Hello. Oh, Giovanna, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, hello, uh, my name is Giovanna, and I'm also a third year in the sociology uh, department graduate student. Hi, everyone. My name is Jared. I'm a first year. Um, doctoral student in the sociology department. Awesome, so our first question kind of is just for us to get to know you better. So if we can have you all talk a little bit about yourselves, why did you choose or pursue sociology? And specifically for our graduate students, why did you choose UC Merced? And we'll start off with Professor Dodson. Um, so, why did I choose sociology? It's, so it's a good question. Um, whenever I was an undergrad, actually, I was a double major in sociology and political science. Um, and I started off as a political science major, and then I took sociology on as a minor. And as I took more and more classes, I was like, this is a lot more interesting than political science. Um, ended up picking it up as a major. And then whenever I applied to graduate school, I had to make a decision about you know, like, what do I want to study for the rest of my life? Um, do I want to study just like voting and elections and political science, or do I want to study something more broad um, and do sociology and study like people maybe voting, but maybe doing other stuff? Um, and whenever I thought about it that way, it just became really clear that, you know, life is long and um, the number of questions if I had gone into political science would be very short um, and quite could get quite boring after a while. Um, so instead, I've I, yeah, I, I picked sociology. It was a pretty clear choice. Um, and I don't know, I love it. I love the idea of like looking at the lens, looking at like social problems through the lens of sociology, thinking about how people, their behavior, like it's not just a function of who they are as individuals and their personalities and their psychological orientations. I like thinking about the role of like larger institutions and how they can constrain behavior and how they help us to think about like why people are the way they are. They don't just like get reduced down to like they're bad people or they're good people. Um, nothing against psychology, but um, I just prefer sociology. Uh, do you want me to popcorn it to somebody else or? All right, um, I will pick Waleed since you're down there. All right, so firstly, why did I pick sociology? So um, I grew up in a family of community activists um, and I would say a part of an eclectic community that um, was composed of a lot of different groups, um, you know, suffering from different forms of oppression. So um, social injustice was always just an interest of mine. And when I got into college, sociology was the natural application of studying social injustices and, and, and why we have social problems and why they occur, why they subsist and how to, um, you know, engage in activism so we can produce social change. Um, as Professor Dotson um, was uh, talking about and so uh, it was just a natural fit for me. I majored in sociology. I also double majored in psychology as well, but so sociology was always uh, my passion. 
And um, what was the second question? Why was it, why did we choose UC Merced? Okay, yeah. So why I chose UC Merced? So um, that's a, there's a huge gap between that. Um, graduated 2011 and I came to Merced two years ago. Um, honestly, it, it was practicality first and foremost. I needed to stay close to the Bay Area. Um, I was um, um, expecting a child and, and me and my spouse, we both um, had to stay close to our parents. And so I had to stay close to the Bay Area. But I'm going to flip that question. I'm going to say, why was I excited to go to UC Merced? Because that's, um, for me, just as important. And that was really, um, because UC Merced is, from what I've seen, very different from the other UCs, and uh, especially the sociology program is a different than a lot of the other soci sociology programs across, across the country. Uh, firstly, I think the faculty is a lot younger, and they're a lot more passionate and more uh, centered on community and uh, uh, bringing about like voicing the opinions of those who are uh, disadvantaged. And so I really appreciate that as opposed to other programs where I have friends I go to and, and they have a completely different experience. It's more elitist and bureaucratic and things like that. And also the campus here, UC Merced has such a diverse campus. I think it is uh, the most diverse UC campus, if I'm not mistaken. And um, because of that, it's, it's such an enriching and empowering experience when I'm TAing um, to, to, to hear from students and their different backgrounds and uh, to produce knowledge together with them. It, it's such a great experience. So that's why I'm excited about UC Merced. I'm supposed to popcorn, right? Uh, all right, so just next on my list is uh, Jared. All right, so why we pick sociology and why UC Merced, correct? All right, cool. So yeah. Um, you know, you know, growing up, I grew up in the projects in San Francisco, and I just seen a lot of uh, just the stuff that comes with it. I'm not going to make it seem odd and unique because it was very normal to me. But um, as I got older, it's like, why, why is this going on, right? Why, why, why are my schools just very punitive? Why do they expel us right away? Um, the police violence and the neighborhood violence, right? Just the people on people violence and police violence that went along with that. So surviving those conditions and making it to college, um, I actually picked up sociology at first. I mean, psychology at first. Um, but the maybe it's just the psychology is always exposed to because I have a BA in psychology, but uh, I minored in sociology. But the psychology I was exposed to was problematic to me. It was more of like correcting behavior, and so I was like, "Well, what about the conditions we're in?" Right? But that's what sociology did in, in my intro class. I took a, or I mean, as minor, I took a juvenile delinquency, which explained a lot of my personal life and um, theory and everything that comes with the minor, right? Um, so that's why I chose sociology. And I, when, I, when I got into college, I've always wanted to be a researcher, no matter what it is. I could have been a biologist, right? So I just wanted to do research, right? So I just came this way. Um, as far as picking UC Merced, a uh, multitude of reasons. I, I can name three off the top. So I had a friend that I knew a long time ago, Marcus Shaw. He graduated from this program. I knew him in a different life, in a different life, right? And it was just interesting, like, whoa, you got a PhD, bro? So. And he told me about the program. So I was interested. I was in my master's in sociology at Sac State. Um, I go about things a little different. So I just came to the campus, knocked on Irene Vietti's door. I was like, hey, tell me about the program, right? <laughs> I should have emailed, but it all worked out. And it just seemed like a real down to earth program. Like, you know, coming from where I came from, a lot of stuff seems elitist, like what Waleed was saying, a different language that I wasn't used to. And this department may not have the same background as me, but they're very accepting and it's understanding and I could be myself, right? Um, when I was looking at different departments like UC Davis and Santa Cruz, I was just like, what is going on, right? So that's why I'm here. Awesome. Um, Giovanna. <laughs> um, Last but not least. Yes. Uh, in terms of why I uh, chose sociology as um, so just really quick, I, as an undergrad, I did major in sociology as well. Um, and when I first entered UC Merced, um, and actually on, on the side note, I am also UC Merced alumni as a grad, uh, undergrad student. Um, but when I first came into UC Merced, I, um, I was considered, um, I was considered, um, Oh, what's that word? I didn't have a major. Uh, undeclared. There you, there you go. I, I wasn't undeclared for like my first two years. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, 
I wasn't sure what I wanted to major in. And so I think one of my classes as general education that I took was sociology, um, introduction to sociology. And so um, I enjoyed the class because it explained and it gave me the vocabulary and it gave me the knowledge to be able to explain the different experiences that I had when I was in high school and um, when I was outside of my home, right? And the different experiences that I had while in my, while at home with my um, family um, in terms of, you know, uh, gender dynamic relationships and microaggressions in high school and different things like that. So I'm like, this is the way I want to go. I want to continue learning about, you know, in the place that we live in, right? And um, learn a little bit more about what's going on. And um, I started taking classes. I started taking, as an undergrad at UC Merced, I started taking different classes. Um, I think I took an in incarceration class. I loved it. I'm like, wow, like, it just gave me a different perspective, th different lens um, through which I was able to see the world that we live in, kind of like uh, Dr. Dalton mentioned, right? Like, that person is not, you know, in jail because they're a bad person. As many people believe, there are many systems in place um, that took that person to that point in life. In terms of why UC Merced, um, as an undergrad, I was actually, I like, I like to say that I was picked by UC Merced because UC Merced invited me to join um, campus, right? I didn't pick UC Merced. And um, in terms of other reasons, my brother was also going to come to UC Merced. So, um, you know, here, here you have two 18, 17 year old, older, um, old teenagers. And so I just kind of wanted to be um, um, close to my to family, um, especially since I came from a very sheltered, close knit family. And then um, the other the other thing, too, is um, I didn't realize how impactful or how uh, beneficial it was to use to go to UC Merced in terms of funding until I actually got here my third or fourth year I realized wow like UC Merced took care of me and my brother um, despite the fact that we you know came from a low socioeconomic status family. Awesome thank you all for sharing. Um, so next question, Professor Dodson, can you talk about some of the courses that you're teaching this term um, and what are some good or um, yeah, what are some good academic behaviors for students to be successful in your courses? And then for our graduate students, if you can talk about that a little bit too. I know a lot of our students are coming back from a virtual world and trying to adapt to in-person learning. Um, so what are some good ac academic behaviors they should be adopting at this point? Uh, yeah, so I teach, um, I, I actually, I teach much, most of the like required classes uh, in our undergraduate program. So, um, so I teach uh, our introduction to sociology. It's what I'm teaching right now this semester. Um, and then I also will sometimes teach research methods, which is SOC 15. And then um, I often teach our sociological statistics class, which is SOC 10. Um, and, and then I also teach other classes that are for a graduate program, um, another stats class. Um, unfortunately, all of the co-panelists have had have had to take my graduate class um, and are currently taking it. Um, and they've all been wonderful TAs for me during intro to sociology. So um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, so, so, so those are classes I teach. Um, I enjoy teaching them all. I think they're fantastic um, opportunities to, to get to know the students um, in all in different ways. Um, in terms of like good behaviors for for students uh, or just sort of good habits to get into i would say like as you come back to in campus um like the first thing i'm trying to think this is it's a it's a big question um and there's like i would say like get to know your professor get to know your if there is a ta in the class get to know them um that both the tas and the, and the instructor of record um they're they're there for you <clears throat> there for you um, we're like resources, um, and a lot of us really enjoy getting to meet the, the students. Um, it's like one of the, one of the best parts of, for me anyway, and I think this is a, a viewpoint that's shared by a lot of faculty that I talk to, not just within sociology, as much as I want people to, to major in sociology, like I'll say that this is kind of one of the best parts about this job is that, um, me and my colleagues, we all really love the undergraduate students and the graduate students, you guys do. 
Um, and like, um, but it's just, it's fantastic. Like our undergrads are like driven They're A lot of them come from like sort of like low income backgrounds or they're students of color. And so this is like, um, it's just a really like this campus is like, I think like one of the very few legitimate like engines of social change out there. Um, and so um, it's really cool to see like these students who come in and um, they just like, I hate this like phrase, but like they take the sort of the bull by the horns on some level and they just like attack the classes and stuff and they're super motivated. Um, but sometimes they don't reach out and that's always like a frustration for me. Like some of them students, some of the students will struggle with the class. Um, and I'm like, you know, it's like, goes like halfway through the semester when they'll finally say like, oh, Professor Dotson, I'm not doing very well in the class and and we'll meet and we'll talk and like we'll figure out some strategies for, for studying for the class or, you know, like making sure we're coming to class and stuff like that. Um, and then, and, and in a lot of instances, like the students will do a lot better because they're at that point, they're more committed and invested in the class. Um, and I just wish like they would reach out sooner. So, so the big thing I would say is like, even if you don't have a specific question to, for, the, for the faculty member or for your TA or whatever, if they have office hours and they almost always do, like go by and just say like, hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. Like I'm so-and-so um and then and we're going to be happy because we're just sitting in that office all by ourselves and this is going to be a chance to, to to actually talk to somebody um and 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 once you do that like the professor and the ta can put a like a face to the name um and we can um like it, it just creates this mutual investment like whenever i see you in class i'm going to be making eye contact eye contact with you um and you're going to be like, as the student, you're going to be like, I don't want to disappoint that guy. Um, and so I'm going to do what I need to do um, and stuff. And it's it's great. This is what I always experienced um, whenever I was an undergrad. Like I would just swing by office hours and bug the professor. Um, so I think that really helped me get involved. So that's that. I, I could go on forever, but I'll say that's the big my big my big suggestion for students as they come back to campus is, yeah, go on a walk, get your ten thousand steps in, and go to office hours. So. Um, I don't know, do, do you guys want me to popcorn to one of you or do you guys just want to, does somebody have something they want to jump in and say? Hearing nothing, I'll just, all right, I'm going to pop, I'm going to go the other way around. I'm going to popcorn to, we'll go to Giovanna. Is that all right? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of um, academic behaviors, um, I, I think one of the things that I want to say is <laughs> Um, I feel like every student is very different in terms of like how they study, um, how they take in information, right? Every student's very unique um, and they tackle um, information in class in the class um, very differently. And so I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you attend like the Bright Success Center or tutoring um, these different resources on campus, they'll be able to provide you different um, study skills, reading skills, all these different things, um, all these different resources. Um, but I think it's up to the student to kind of take um, what best meets their needs as a student, um, just because whatever, you know, might work for me may not work for, you know, my, my uh, classmate will lead. Um, and so I think some of the academic behaviors that I've also seen in students who are super, um, they're, um, they do well in class and they're successful is, you know, one is this discipline, especially right now during COVID, um, you, when you may be half hybrid, like half online and the other half you're on campus. Um, and then there's a lot of distractions at home or, you know, at your, or at your parents' home, homes um, that it's kind of hard to concentrate, um, you know, staying organized, being persistent. I know sometimes we may encounter, you know, troubles here and there, whether that's family, whether that's in school or, you know, any other types of relationships that we, we may have. And, kind of like the basics attending class and um, what Dr. Dobson said, meeting your professor, you never know, maybe later on, you may want to go to grad school, you're going to need a letter of recommendation or just want to know a little bit more about, you know, hey, like what can we do with a social major um, in the future? Um, and then um, the last, um, um, the last kind of thing that I was going to say with this is um, also have fun, right? Like getting, get involved on campus. Um, a student, you know, if a student just staying in their dorm or at home studying, 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 you know, um, they need to take care of themselves um, by also having fun and getting involved on, on the UC Merced campus. And I will go ahead and go with Jared. Very great. So good academic behavior to be 
I don't like that word behavior. But all right, so I would say as an undergrad, I can go back to undergrad. I was in the CSU system, so it might be a little different. But, um, you know, my grandma said closed mouth don't get fed, right? So just always being able to talk, talk appropriately, of course, and what's necessary. But um, asking the right questions and what um, to allude to Kyle Dotson is something I used to always do. Um, I'd frequent office hours and you'll find the professors that you're closer with and whatnot. But uh, yeah, like uh, opportunities come and when people get to know you, you could end up being the first person they email to give an opportunity, right? Whether it's a research opportunity, um, a chance to meet, um, you know, or even leniency on, on grading if they understand like some issues you may have. Like me, I, I wasn't really much of a, a heavy writer coming in, right? And I had professors that took an interest in me and get, um, put, took me into programs in college to enhance my writing. I'm a pretty good writer now. So um, stuff like that. Um, as far as like personal behavior, I'd say um, staying, having a good rhythm. So not really a balance, but a rhythm, right? Um, and it's something I'm relearning again in this PhD program. But uh, be it, you know, time management, um, you know, not cramming. I see, I see a lot of people do this in undergrad. And uh, my wife, for instance, we went to some undergrad and uh, undergrad together. And, you know, she'd have a group of friends and they'd all be like studying for the test like a day before. And I was studying, you know, a week before. So, you know, just be, <laughs> being ahead of the curve. Seriously, that's how you keep your grades up. That's how the brain works. Uh, you know, so um, being punctual on time. Um, nobody likes a person that's late. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. There's a lot more, but I think that's pretty much foundational. And getting involved in campus, that, that's a real big thing. That's one of the cool things I did. And you get a lot of change done. None of these campuses are perfect here and, and you know, need to be challenged. Outside, um, outside of being challenged, um, just having fun too. But when you're a part of an organization, you could make the, the college better and whatnot. So that's that. Brother Waleed. Got you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I want to echo what everybody said, especially in regards to uh, coming to office hours. Um, that's really important. Um, and also what Giovanna said about student, every student is different. People learn differently. Um, I'll just highlight, highlight one thing that I've noticed as a TA for the past couple of years. And now um, I think folks can improve, students can improve a little bit on their note taking. And there's a lot of different methods to go through. I'll just say the one thing that worked for me and feel free to try it if it works. If it doesn't, just throw it out there. But someone taught me this and um, it worked. Uh, basically, when you're in class um, and the professor is speaking, don't let your pen leave the pad or don't stop typing whatever tool you're using. And the reason for this is more so not to capture as much information, but it's actually, actually a little bit helps with memory. It's psychological. You're typing everything down. And when re re you review it uh, later that day or the next day, um, there's a kind of replaying going on in your head where you're seeing the examples and the flow of the, the, the lecture and things are sinking in a little bit more because you basically have a transcription of the lecture of the class. It's really time intensive. Like I said, try it. If it doesn't work for you, um, you don't have to. But I have noticed that students who have problems on test day, um, or on assignments really aren't doing well note-taking that. When I ask to see their notes, I see they're not really doing a good job. They just might be copying the slides and you need to do a lot more than that, especially in your last two years. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, so next question, more pertaining to the research side now. Um, can you all talk a little bit about your, what are your research interests and how can students do research in this particular major or get involved with it on campus? That's an awesome question. Um, so I study politics. Um, if, you, I, if you remember, I was like, oh, a political science major and a sociology major. And so I just decided I wanted to do politics from a more of a sociological perspective. Um, somewhat ironically, I still kind of am studying the questions that I didn't want to be studying for the rest of my life. Um, so, um, but I, so I, I tend to do, um, I like to look at individual behavior and think about like, why is it that some people protest? Why do they not protest? Like how do people who protest differ from people who don't protest? Um, how do people who vote differ from people who don't vote? How do people who vote for a certain 
political party, they vote Republican. How do they differ from people who vote Democratic? Um, and they also like to think about like different differences between countries in these behaviors. So like how do people who vote in the United States differ from people who vote in Europe? For example? I mean, uh, not vote, um, people who protest in the United States. How do they differ from people who protest in the United States or in Europe? Um, I use it, I, I usually analyze these questions using survey data. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of organizations out there who um, just put out these huge surveys. Um, they're over time, they've been doing it for a long time. It's across a lot of countries. Um, and so it's really cool to go in and download the data that they've collected and examine it. Um, it's just a, a treasure trove of, of, of information. Um, in terms of like research opportunities for undergraduates, there's I you know there's kind of like I guess like three different approaches to this. Like one is what I would offer, and that's you know I'm always happy to if an undergraduate wants to come in like do stuff with me um, and do research with me. I, I'm always happy to do that. Um, unfortunately, like it's typically unpaid. So it'd just be like, hey, let's do a research project together. And the benefit to you is you get experience, um, which is useful, especially if you think you want to do um, uh, like graduate school after you after you get your college degree. Um, having that kind of research experience is, is a real plus on, a, on an application. Um, and I'm always happy to do that. Sometimes it's maybe I'm working on a project and I've got some stuff for the undergraduate to do. I think it tends to work better if the undergraduate has an idea that they're interested in um, and I can help them on that project to like go find the data and, and think about how to analyze it. Um, so like what, an unpaid research sort of experience is, is one option. At the other end, some faculty do have some money from grants that they can pay undergraduates um, that they can use to pay undergraduates to help them do research. Um, and we do have some faculty in our department who have, have been doing this recently. Um, Professor Tanya Golash Boza is, is one, I think, I think she has like 10 undergraduate research assistants or something. I think like she just walked into a class and kidnapped a mark or something. I don't know how she has that many students, but, but she's got a bunch. So, um, and I think she's working on a project that deals with like gentrification in, in Washington, DC. So if that appeals to you and excites you, um, you should reach out to her and see if she's got any, any research um, opportunities. And I think Waleed's done some work with that as well. Um, so, 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 yeah, so one option is the unpaid research experience. The other is a paid research experience. Um, and the middle ground is we do have some programs on campus where you can apply. It's competitive, but if you have like a, a research project you're interested in pursuing, um, like there's like, I think UROC is one option where you can apply. Um, and if you're accepted, um, you'll be given money to, to basically do some research over a summer um, in partnership with a faculty member who can mentor and advise you on that project. And that's really exciting because then you're kind of, you're doing your own thing um, and the faculty member there is, is sort of a resource for you and you're getting some money and you get all that experience. It's gonna be great for, for applying to graduate school. So, um, but in general, I would say like, don't ever hesitate to ask a, a professor if there's anything that they need help with. Um, even if they say no, they may have ideas for, for, for other people. Um, it can be intimidating, but we're people. Like just just ask us and we're generally pretty nice. So um I don't know. So we'll go with Jared. You're gonna get popcorn this time. So um reframe the question again. What do you what's your research interest and then like the opportunities for, for doing research? Um that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So my research interest particularly um sociology of education. Um Social, um, educational inequalities. Um, coming from a master's program, I actually did most of my thesis and whatnot, and I think I'm about to rebuild on it here. But um, I, I look more towards the continuation schools, the behavior-focused alternative schools. That's why I'm really like more focused on, just because you see a lot of um, educational inequality literature, and they focus on you know a multitude of things. I just don't see much on continuation schools when I was diving into that. And, and some of the research questions on continuation schools wasn't, you know, because, well, I'll say where my interests come from. I'm actually a continuation high school graduate, right? And you don't come across too many of us in college, right? Because this is, continuation high school is not a pathway to college. Um, you can only go to a junior college from there. And then, you know, what you're taught at continuation high school, it makes it hard. So that's my research interests. I can go on about that. But um, as far as 
getting research as an undergraduate, um, I came from the CSU, so I have a little experience with that, but not as much as some people that may have came from the UCs or the bigger uh, research institutions. But I, th I think a, a main thing if, um, so at, at the UC, right, this is, uh, I think they call it R2 school, maybe it's R1, who knows, but everybody's doing research, right? So all, all the professors for the most part are doing research unless they're a lecturer. So, you know, just asking, asking questions and asking to get on board. Um, I actually met with UROC students, so that is a, um, I guess that's another route you could go to, you'd apply to it. Um, and I think if you're applying to graduate school, it's very important to get some research under your belt. Um, and that's why I did the master's first because I came from the CSU and there wasn't much offered there, in particular my CSU. But going to the master's, I had, um, I was able to do my own research with my thesis, which shows that I was able to do a thesis, right? And I was also able to do applied research, which is a different conversation. I think that's a later question as well. So that's pretty much what I have on that. Um, Giovanna. Uh, thank you. Um, so let's see, in terms of my research interest, um, uh, kind of like Jared, I am also interested in um, education, specifically higher education, I'm interested in gender um, and immigration. Right now, um, the project that I'm currently look, uh, working on is looking at gender differences within um, the uh, immigrant community, Latinx immigrant community, um, specifically college students. And uh, let's see, in terms of research opportunities, I think this goes back to what we all mentioned earlier, right? Like going to office hours um, to your professors uh, within the classes that you're taking in the sociology department. Um, and I can actually um, talk a little bit more about that just because like it, you know, in terms that, you know, it, it works, like that's the way to get some research opportunities if, you, if that's what you're looking for. Um, because as an undergrad at UC Merced, I attended Dr. Irene Speedy's office hours because um, I was in one of her classes and I was asking her if she had any, you know, research opportunities and like I think two weeks or three weeks later, um, she emailed me because it wasn't her who needed an undergrad, but it was um, Professor uh, Nella Bambay who needed a research assistant. Um, so, you know, again, because I went to her office hours, I introduced myself and I talked to her. I wanted to know more about her, what she was working on. Um, she, you know, she was able to um, let me know about the opportunity with Dr. Nala Van Dyke, who's also part of the um, sociology department. Um, and then the other thing too, um, I, um, I don't know if this is always the case, and Dr. Dalton, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that, but I know recently um, grad students sometimes, you know, they, they get a grant or, you know, they have a little bit of money and they're able to hire um, undergrad students to help them with their research. I know that's the current case with one of our, one of our, one of our classmates in, in the program. All right. Um... So my research interest is on gentrification, um, specifically how local policy influences uh, gentrification. And then um, also looking at how gentrification impacts the health of low-income residents um, and uh, how that in turn also affects hospitalization rates. Uh, so if you're interested in health, um, it's a good uh, seg segue or intersection between sociology and public health. I also have a public health background. Um, but uh, and, and in terms of uh, undergrad participating in research, I don't really know too much about that. And I think most of us have covered it. Um, I would say also do your research too. I think like you don't need to, just because you're a sociology major doesn't need, you need to reach out to sociology department. There's so many other centers and uh, projects going on even um, with other faculty members. So uh, yeah. Feel free to reach out to, to other folks as well. And then one other thing to highlight, I know Professor Dodson talked about um, unpaid research, right? Working with a professor. Um, you do have the, the opportunity to possibly get academic credit for, for research, right? So if you are interested in pursuing research with a professor, um, and you're looking to get academic credit for that, we do highly advise you to come and meet with your academic advisor and Shaw academic advising, um, whether it's through virtual walk-in hours or through an appointment, and we can talk more about that process with you um, and how to go about getting credit. Um, any other 
points or anything else before we move on to the next question? Okay, we're good. Okay, next question. So we talked a little bit about research. Um, I also wanted to expand a little bit on um, the types of careers that students can go into with sociology. Yeah, it's a big question that that I get asked a lot from from our majors, um, and I think it's this is I'm excited because we have a lot of people on the panel who have non-academic experiences, so um, it'll be interesting to hear what people say. So I think like what I typically I'm sorry, just as a sort of a side note, um, I've got children coming home from school, um, so I apologize for any distractions that may happen. Um, and I'm outside and our dogs are out here because my wife is also on a Zoom call um, and our dogs like to bark, so um, apologies. Um, anyway, so yeah, what I, what I typically tell folks about like, you know, what do I do with a sociology major? How do I like get a job is, um, you know, it's both like a, it's a, like a blessing and a curse having a sociology major like when we compare it to like other kinds of majors out there that like right if you like have a i don't know like if you major in like computer science or accounting like the kinds of jobs you get with those majors is i think pretty straightforward like like you if you're a computer science major you're probably going to go into like a tech field right if you're an accounting major you're probably going to end up getting an accounting job um which is nice like that kind of reduces like the, the worries and the concerns about like, what do I do after I graduate? I'm gonna go do this. It's like straight linear um, process. With a sociology major, it's like, you can still do whatever the heck you want to. Um, like like you're, when you major in sociology, you don't major in a career necessarily, right? You're not choosing a career when you choose to major in sociology. You're just choosing, in my mind, like what we do, is like you're just choosing to have a certain skill set that you can take with you into whatever career you wanna go into. Um, and I think it's really useful, like, um, for the students who, th who are thinking about majoring in sociology is to go to somewhere on the UC's website. We have our, what we call our program learning outcomes listed, um, our PLOs, and that kind of gives students an idea of what we hope our majors leave knowing, like, what are the skill sets we want them to have? And it's things like thinking critically about inequality, being able to, like, um, examine data, like, take an empirical approach, um, being able to, like, discuss and to write about social inequality, uh, being aware of inequality. And I think these are really important skills that you can and should take with you into whatever job you want to. Like we have majors who go into, into education, who go into politics, who go into management, and to, they go into IT, they go into technology, they go work for Facebook, they go get jobs anywhere they want, but they go and they have this really great skill set. Um, that they've learned from sociology that helps them to think about, you know, the importance of broader social contexts, like how do policies matter? How do institutions matter? How does like this broader environment matter for what we're seeing in this, in this place? Um, so, so the question of like, what can you do with a sociology major? Um, it's anything, you're still limit, you're limited by your, by your imagination on this one, which is scary, I get, but, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to, what, what job you got to go get. I, I want you to go get a job that like, um that sort of speaks to you and like makes you happy and increasingly we're actually saying that like when people choose career like when they choose a job and they choose an industry like they don't stay in that industry forever they're sort of hop industries right so like you start off in this field then you go over here then you go over there then you go over there um and so having that skill set i think is really useful as you um as you navigate that process okay and i can't really speak because i just went from undergrad then i went to graduate school and then I went and got a job in academia. So I haven't been off a college campus in a, in a very, very long time. Um, so I'm actually curious to hear what um, the experiences of our co-panelists are. Um, I'm gonna go back around now. I'm starting with Waleed again. All right, uh, thank you, Professor. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Like I think that the essential quality that sociology gives to students is not necessarily a career, but it's the capacity to capacity to think critically. Um, that's your biggest weapon. That's your biggest asset. And um, then you can just enter the world and <laughs> go into any field. And it's really like that. Um, I worked for about eight years, and I was also in a few of my positions, like to a limited degree, in, uh, involved in hiring processes. So I would say this question really. I mean, this pertains more to the experience through internships and work that you do and um during these last two years 
um, than it necessarily does to your major. Um, you can literally be a sociology major and go into a broad range of fields. Like if you're still interested in medicine, you could be a social major, take all your med school requirements and go into medicine. If you're interested in public health, you can go into public health, social work, et cetera, et cetera. When I was a student, um, it was kind of limited to even those like soft sciences degrees, but even now, so like uh, even with a curriculum of Merced's sociology program, like you have a little bit of background in data science, that's enough to build and go into um, like some sort of coding, a coding certificate program or um, a data science program if you're interested in going in that direction. So um, I, I would, I, I agree with Professor Dodson, I think, um, there's a wide range of opportunities um, that are there for you. I think it's more so based on the type of internships and experience you get at this point, and it's critical. And if we cover that in the in the um, later on in the panel, I'll be happy to go into more detail about that. Oh, Leslie Popcorn, uh, Giovanna. Awesome, thank you, Walid. Um, let's see, for me, um, when I graduated with my uh, bachelor's in sociology, I went straight to um, to uh, to grad school, um, to graduate school for a master's degree. Um, I actually went into counseling, which um, kind of supports the idea that both Dr. Dotson and Walid are talking about, right? Like you can you can branch out to other different types of um careers in um you know grad school or medical school um so i went to cal state long beach um, for a master's degree in counseling and higher education and i was able to use a skill set that you know um the other panelists were talking about in terms of you know this lens this sociology sociological lens that i have to be able to look at you know um to help students with with their academics right with their career pathway with their educational pathway. Um, and then at CSU, I was given the training um, as a counselor to be able to actually do the counseling um, for students. So I, I was very happy with, with that, um, with being able to merge both what I learned as a social major at UC Merced and my ex different experiences with the training that I got as a counselor. Um, with that information, what I ended up doing, I ended up being a counselor, an academic counselor um, at the community college, right? And I don't know, um, in, um, in terms of community colleges compared to four-year institutions, they're very different environments. Um, the student population, very different um, access to all, meaning we have all types of students, all types of majors coming in, studying, wanting to, wanting to study different things. Um, so I was definitely able to um, pick out of the different skill set that I was that I gained both at UC Merced and at Cal State Long Beach to be able to perform my job to do my job and be able to help students. Um, I decided I I am back in school for a PhD in sociology because I really enjoyed the teaching aspect of counseling. Although I I like the counseling um, uh, aspect of it. Um, I really like the teaching at, um, I really like the teaching aspect and I love my experience as a researcher in my um, in my grad in my grad program at Cassie Long Beach. Um, and then the last thing that I was just gonna say is I do have like my sister, my sister is a sociology major and she's currently um, a CNA. Um, and then I do have other friends who um, they, were social majors and they were at it, um, on uh, campus as well. So, awesome. And I think Jared might have had connection issues. Um, oh, he's back. Jared, are you there? Hello. Oh, there you, you go. Me? Yes, right. I can hear you now. Cool. I wonder if I should connect to my, um, I don't know, worst case scenario, I'm going to connect to my, um, the, the phone one, the, um, anyways, is it on me now? Or, or? Yes, it's your turn. Okay, great. You know, it's kind of threw me out of sync, but, um, 
Yeah, as far as um, this is careers, right? Yeah. Careers, right? Hold on. This is horrible. Still there? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Mm, still hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. I think I'm cool. All right. Yeah. So careers are trying to be as quick as possible before anything weird happens. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think, I believe, um, you know, sociology doesn't put you on that track to, you know, this is the job, right? But the, the stuff we study and how we analyze the world uh, makes great for a lot of different careers. So I know people personally and myself who've done several things. So um, my wife has a BA in sociology and, um, went and got her MSW, but she's a social worker, CPS worker out here in Merced County. Um, they make very decent money and they, they do real good stuff. And um, a lot of a lot of these jobs kind of have like a, a bad historical background, whether it's probation, social work, um, et cetera, et cetera. But with what we know in sociology, um, that can make it kind of transformative, you know, individually. And maybe, maybe at the whole entire institution, but, um, I know when I first got into sociology, um, it got me into being a political organizer for Tom Steyer's um, CPAC, um, Political Action Committee. Um, and I did applied research. So before I knew I was coming to the PhD program, I did applied research and I was aiming to work for the state of California, either in the Department of Education or Department of Social Services as a researcher. So there's a lot of researcher jobs out there. Um, and then I, um, I see a lot of, uh, I have a friend who has a sociology degree, they work in HR right now, and just, you know, having that sociological perspective, just, you know, what we hear about HR is pretty crazy, right? So having those type of people in there. And um, I think what's one thing interesting about UC Merced, and I haven't seen it too many other schools, is that UC Merced has a teaching credential program that goes hand in hand during your four years here. So instead of graduating and then going on to a teaching credential through a K through 12 program, you could get it while you're doing your four years. So I suppose that'd be another route um, of interest as a sociology major, get your credential the same way and go teach in the K through 12 system. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Yeah, just to expand a little bit. So we have the teacher preparation program, right? So for students, um, if you major in the, um, natural sciences education credentialing minor, um, you will start off with the program um, and then there's a year after that you stay, right, where you complete the programming and the credentialing um, to become a teacher. So it's a really cool program for students that are interested. Once again, um, if that's something that you're considering and you want to be connected to that resource to talk more about that program, um, please feel free to come visit us at Shaw Academic Advising. Um, and then final question for you all. Um, we talked a lot about research and careers. Um, we have graduate students here and we have a lot of students that might want to uh, participate or consider grad school as an option. Um, in terms of graduate school, there's master's programs and there's PhD programs and sometimes students have difficulty deciding what exactly they can pursue um, and why they should pursue a master's instead of, you know, a doctor, doctorate program. So can you all expand on that a little bit more and what are the, the options with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the first bit of advice I would say, I would offer to students is um, like make like right, go talk to the, the faculty, the faculty members who you trust um, to get advice from them um, because they've been through the process. Talk to graduate students; they've been through the process, um, and they can kind of because it's such a like Byzantine like overwhelming process like I like you like I knew nothing about graduate school whenever I was applying to it it was like I, I th th like if I knew then what I know now, know now kind of thing um so like go go talk to people who have experience with it um and they can help you out um and, and I know that in like for example in sociology we typically like once a year um this is pre-covid would have a uh like a workshop on applying to graduate school um and so it's usually organized by our sociology club um, and faculty and graduate students go to that. We talk about, um, I think in more depth, like what that process is like. Um, the one thing I would have, sort of the biggest piece of advice I would give folks who are applying to graduate school is to um, 
do your try as much as you possibly can to avoid having to pay for an advanced degree because um, they are insanely expensive. Um, and one way to do that is like it's, it's to effectively apply to a PhD program. Um, a lot of PhD programs, not all, but a lot of PhD programs will fund you. Um, when you're in that PhD program, they'll they'll waive your tuition if you're a TA or an RA, meaning a teaching assistant or a research assistant, um, and then they'll give you money on top of that. Um, so it's not a lot, um, unfortunately. It could always, always, always be more, um, but um, but it's but it's but it's something. Um, and then usually what happens in these PhD programs is along the way um, you will write a master's thesis and you'll be awarded a, a master's degree, um, and at that point. If you don't want to continue on in your in your educational goals, um, you can leave the program and you can leave with a master's program and you would didn't have to pay for it. Um, so that's like the biggest piece of advice I would give folks. That said, there are some master's programs out there that you may find yourself having to apply for uh, because the career you want to go into requires that particular kind of MA, um, in which case, unfortunately, the cost of the MA can't be avoided. But if it is avoidable, do everything you can to avoid it because, uh, you know, working off Fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt is 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 substantial, and it's a lot of money, um, and it will be with you for a very very long time. So um, that's that's the short of it. Um, but also, like, reach out to faculty. You can always reach out to me, and I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go with Jared first this time. Okay. So this was um, restate the question. Applying to graduate school, like for students Applying who have who, who have ambitions of going and getting an advanced degree. Stressful, but um, I'd say so. I, I did. I I got into two master's programs, San Jose and Sac State. Chose Sac State, and I obviously I'm here. Um, I say one of the big differences is, of course, funding. I'm thirty thousand in debt because of my master's, right? But now in this PhD program, I will never pull out another loan, right? So I wish I would knew that before. Nobody told me that. So that's that's a real great thing, especially because I want the PhD now. I know what I want because I I, I fought through the masters. So I'm not going to stop us after these two years, but um, yeah, if I wouldn't do that, it would have made a big difference. So that's very critical. Um, getting ahead on, you know, the 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 application process. So there's fees, um, there's statement of purposes, there's a format for it, there's letters of rec. So understanding all that, and then as far as knowing what you want, I, I still don't really know what I want, but I know deep down I want to be a professor and still do research. So that's my point, but the master's route, I could have taught, right? I think I still could taught at, at a JC, and I think it's part-time at the UCs and stuff like that, um, and the CSUs. But um, there's a lot of applied work and nonprofit work, if you're into that, that that master's of sociology sets you up for. And um, I know when I was at Sac State, a lot of those people in that field came to our classes. They had a certain class that brought all these people, applied researchers from all over the state and whatnot. Um, the PhD route, so when I was getting um, introduced to those applied researchers, there were also people who had a PhD in sociology and applied route because they didn't like academia. So I suppose that's a that's something that's opening up now with the PhD. People aren't pushing you too heavily into um, academia. Um, so yeah, there's those two routes, and there's there's a lot of stuff. I, I'm a firm believer sociologists are needed everywhere, right? Even though it's not fully happening yet, but so those are pretty much my tips and talk to the professors and come to me too. I mean, I got into, if, if you need help or anything like that, writing a statement of purpose, um, I still have mine. And what I did, there was a, there was a student, real cool student, Steph Landeros. Um, they're at um, UNLV right now, I think second year in the PhD program, but we followed each other. So they got into the master's program at UNR year later I got into the Masters of SAC, but each time they um, sent me their statement of purpose and we just followed it, you know, it's just like a, a template. I just switched like to my story, but you know, the, the word format, uh, and the word count, um, what I should talk about, keeping it sociological, not, you know, being too um, informal and whatnot. So talk to other students that have already done it and professors because they know what they're looking for. They know what they want to see when people apply. And, um, that's pretty much that. I don't think, I think there may be still sociology programs that are taking the GRE. The two places I, I applied to, San Jose State and Sac State for my master's, didn't need it. And uh, UC Merced didn't care for it either. And it's not a great way to assess a person's intelligence either. So 
Um, that's pretty much what I have. I will pop it off to Wally. Yeah, so um, similar to Jared, I was uh, I, I also was in a um, a master's program and accumulated debt as a result. Um, and I was in a public health program. I actually stopped midway to come here um, because I knew I really wanted a PhD. So there was no point in continuing there. Um, but I'll say this, just, ex, you know, kind of theme in this panel has been like, you know, every person's journey is a little different. And so um, I would say like, don't feel the need to rush into a graduate program, especially right after college. A lot of people do it and they turn out great and they have successful careers. But I think it's that journey is not for everybody. And I know for myself, I really had to take time to explore um, the work field, to find out what I was really passionate about and what I wanted to do, uh, learn from my mistakes, uh, center myself, like you're still growing um, mentally. Um, and, you know, that post-college experience, a lot of times the opportunity to just take a break and, you know, you can work, you can travel, um, and experience a little bit of life before saying, okay, now I know what I want to commit to. I want to commit to a master's program or PhD program. Um, I know wanna, I, I want to uh, accumulate that debt for a specific purpose. Um, unfortunately, that's how it is sometimes. Um, I will say this for a PhD program, especially talking about specific sociology, like you really have to know you like it and you want it. Um, if um, you know, I, I, we spend hours and hours reading and writing and it's painful and it sucks. But at the end of the day, you're like, oh, I loved it. I enjoyed that. This, you know, we talk about for three hours, we talk about Marx and it's boring sometimes, but at the end of the day, we could be like, wow, like that was a really invigorating talk. I loved hearing from folks. If that's you, then, you know, the PhD program is for you. If you're like, I hate that. I hate writing. I hate reading. Then you kind of know that it's not for you. Um, but still take time to explore and find yourself because I think that's also really important. And go ahead, Giovanna. Thank you, Ali. Um, you know what, Ali? Sometimes I, I just hate it. <laughs> it's endless. <laughs> um, but um, I'm just, you know, just going to go off what Walid is saying. Um, I think. Um, from my experience, I enjoyed my time in grad school. I did spend, usually master programs are two years. Um, my master's program was a three year program and um, I was very fortunate and very lucky that I did not get in debt with that master's degree. Um, I did have to pay student fees, but I was working um, it, at the school. I got a fellowship um, which helped me, um, you know, give me that extra income to be able to pay those. Um, it was like a $500 fee. Um, but luckily, I, you know, I was lucky to be able to, um, to get that tuition paid for with scholarships for my master's programs, for my master's program. Um, but kind of what Willie was saying, you know, when you are looking into, into grad program or trying to decide between a master's and a, a PhD, um, you know, I think this is when you kind of have to look ahead in terms of like, you know, five years, six years, three years, like where are you in those three years um, when you get out of uh, um, undergrad, right? Like, are you still trying to, are you trying to move out of your parents? Are you, you know, where in life are you? I think those are those other, those are other aspects that you need to take, you need to take into consideration um, just because if you, you know, for example, I had to go to, you know, I ended up going to grad school, but in order to be able to save, because I'm still a student, right, and I wasn't making much, um, I still lived with my parents, and they still helped me and supported me in terms of rent, because um, I know being from LA, um, I, I could not, um, I couldn't um, afford living on my own um, in an apartment down here in LA, because it's so expensive. Um, and then the other thing too, right, like knowing that that's what you want to do, just because um, like what Lee mentioned, um, it's hard work, like it's hard work um, and you are spending, you know, if you go to a PhD program, you are spending six years, seven years um, of your life, you know, um, working on this PhD, right, and um, I know, you know, I don't think you want to be in a place where like, you know, you're a third year or a fourth year and you're like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I'm tired. Like, this is not what I wanted to do. Um, you know, that 
you know, not that you just wasted four years, but, you know, that was a lot of resources, both on your end um, and, you know, people around you. Um, in terms of a master's degree, like I mentioned, like that one is, you know, three year program. And these programs, I feel like as you get, as you get, um, you know, you get out of undergrad and you get to like grad school, whether it's a PhD or a master's degree, they're very like specific, right? Like they're super more specific versus an undergrad. You had all these different um, choices to make um, and you have two years to, um, to, to, two years to decide. And like Dr. Dotson mentioned earlier, as a social major, you can choose different uh, fields of work. Um, with a master's degree and a PhD, they're very specific. I My master's was in counseling and high, specifically in higher education, right? Like specifically in higher education. I couldn't be a counselor at a um, in K-12 because I didn't have a PPS, right? Um, I didn't have that training. And now with, you know, now that I'm in this social program, you know, I, you know, I, I'm mastering in different, um, I'm mastering different research skills and fields um, that I'm currently studying. Awesome. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists. This was really great information for our students. I think that um, one thing to be aware of, right, their resources, right, your instructors, your, these graduate students, they're here to support you as well in your journey. Uh, while you're here as an undergrad here at UC Merced. So um, take advantage of the resources that you have. We, your academic advising center, are also a resource for you. Um, if you need help with getting access to a certain resource, we'd be more than happy to direct you. Um, I want to thank our panelists' time for joining us today, um, and thank you all for participating and joining in on the panel. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Amandeep, for organizing this. I mm -hmm. appreciate it. Bye-bye.